This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Alrighty, welcome everyone. Thank you for sticking around. I want to introduce our special guests tonight, Mr. Mardik Martin, co-screenwriter of Mean Streets, and Rami Katrib, who is a documentarian who did Mardik from Baghdad to Hollywood. And we're going to start with a Q&A about Mean Streets. So can we go back to Mean Streets and mean talk street, about okay. uh, and talk well, about the writing process, okay. which is very adventurous and involves a certain red valiant? Uh, it, it, well, Mean Streets was the film that may open the doors for Marty, for Bob De Niro, uh, uh, a lot of the people who were attached to it suddenly jumped the, the, the stand into a higher plateau. And uh, I don't want to forget anybody. Jonathan Taplin. Harvey produced Keitel. It. Oh? Harvey. Harvey Keitel. How could I forget the star? Uh, uh, anyway, the point is, we, Marty and I have been working on ideas to present, to make us a rival. <laughs> as a filmmaker. I was working as a waiter at that time. And even though we had made some shorts at NYU, we were looking for the big time. And that included writing things on spec. And so one of the things we were doing was looking at the area where Marty lived. And I was living there in that area too, called Little Italy and in the Greenwich Village. And we saw a lot of interesting character. They were not gangsters, in a way, but they were petty crooks. And they were all over the place, trying to get money for something uh, to eat, uh, conning people. And uh, anyway, they were all over the place. Uh, so Marty and I decided uh, he, oh, he wanted to do his thesis at USC, at NYU. And he wrote a story that wasn't very good, but it was his thesis. I helped him, and it was called, Who's That Knocking on My Door? And which, which got him the master's degree and got me uh, a lot of thank yous for people who knew I was there and helped him. So we said, let's, I said, why don't we make these into a feature that everybody can see? And let me, I'm very good at construction of the structure of the movie. So I took it over and used the same basic character, cutting a lot of the characters out and combining, which is really the hardest thing to do in screenwriting, is making two, three characters into one character and having the same things happen. Uh, so anyway, so after working for a year and a half, almost two years, on and off, I want to remind you, because you don't write a screenplay, you rewrite. I hope you remember that. So, uh, and one of the problems was he was married, I was married, and our wives hated the idea of going into making movies for a living. They thought it was stupid. So we had to, uh, you know, make a living, writing, screenplay, making movies, ridiculous for them. So we had to do a lot of writing in my car while parked in a snow-covered streets. I have some pictures of it. Uh, but the point is, uh, that's 
we got to give that old Plymouth uh, credit. <laughs> and so well, after that, uh, we got lucky. Some young producer, Jonathan Taplin, saw what was done earlier by the shorts and all that, and he said, let's see if I can raise you the money. I will not tell you how he raised the money, but he did half a million dollars almost. And we started shooting, and I couldn't believe that we were actually shooting a movie, but we were, feature. Yeah. And then it got shot in Los Angeles. Well, what happened, of course, is while the scenes were written over many months, Sometimes in Los Angeles, sometimes we're in LA, New York. It depends of how time, because they weren't getting paid. That's the main thing to remember. We were just taking a chance, wasting our time or hoping to catch the red the balloon, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and then we, once the movie was released, they were editing, carrying the buckets with the, uh, films in it from place to place, showing it to people. We showed it to somebody, I won't mention names, and he actually walked out on the first reel, you know, he, he said, please don't waste my time, um, to get a uh, distributor. For Finally, we got a distributor at Warner's, and John Kelly, who recently passed away, God bless his soul. Anyway, he bought it, and was shown at the New York Film Festival about a year, 41 years ago, <laughs> to show you how old I am. Anyway, it was uh, very successful, got great reviews, didn't make any money, but it was, we became respectable. And that's opened the doors for me to stop teaching and do something I could afford, which is go to Hollywood and be one of the last people to write, have a seven-year contract with uh, MGM. Uh, I don't know if any, anybody knows what a seven-year contract was at that time, but I, you can figure it out. <laughs> anyway, I was uh, with Charlotte Winkler and we made a lot of my, uh, movies. I read all of them, I brought it to them, including Rocky, which became a big hit, Cubs Horseman. Anyway, that was my job, to read scripts and to write them. And I got a big bonus for each movie that were made, include, that were, if, yeah, that were made. Any other questions? Well, yeah, I mean, when you mentioned the New York Film Festival and that Lincoln screening that was, just changed everything. And, mm. you know, filmmakers, who were aspiring filmmakers at the time have said that there was before Mean Streets and there That's was exactly after right. street, Mean Very Streets. Good. And that it changed their ideas about what film could be and Overnight. is so authentic and so it changes yeah. so many people's lives that One, it's just remarkable. One right. quick note about that. Um, we, we worked on a film with Mardik over like a 10 year period. One of the most memorable thing was to go back to the neighborhoods that Mean Street was based on and meet people that would talk about it in a way where when they saw it for the first time, they couldn't believe what they were seeing. You know, it, a lot of, there was a deli owner that I'll never forget. It was like, it felt like watching home movies, you know? And he would describe how he would watch it with his kids and put, you know, put the VHS in and watch it over and over because there were no movies like that where people talked like us, people looked like us. And then on a whole, different plane, we would interview, you know, uh, Amy Her Heckerling, who did one of my favorite movies of all time, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, and she said that's the movie that inspired Fast Times at Ridgemont High, and it's pretty remarkable because they're so different, but that authenticity had a profound effect on people all around the world and kind of changed the way uh, movies are made and the tone of movies. Really did. And, and to meet the people from those neighborhoods is what really brought it home. It's one thing to talk about it, it's another thing to meet people from those neighborhoods where they you know, grab you by the arm and look you in the eye and say, that movie changed things for me. And I think that's what your documentary captures really beautifully, that Oh, that's the a impact documentary of that. that uh, it's a wonderful it's documentary. It's called Baghdad to Hollywood, which is uh, my story uh, for a while. 
until the 12 years ago, I think. That was when you stopped. I mean, we, we didn't need to go on. It was more the, like a life experience of shooting Marduk over a 10 year period. And I by the way, it's updated. <laughs> of course. It's impossible to make a documentary about a storyteller, just heads up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I do want to. When you watch, when you watch Mean Street right now, it sounds like a lot of the dialogue has been uh, improvised on the spot, but that's not true. That was what made the screenplay difficult. It had to be written like it was made, the stories were improvised. A lot of it was in the script, actually, done exactly, because I rewrote it as they were rehearsing it. So changes occurred while they were rehearsing it. A lot of changes, and that's, that's the true. All of you, are, I assume, are interested in being, making movies. And of course, the basic of a good movie is the script. You gotta start with a foundation. It's like a flower with that, uh, that, that doesn't express itself or write without having a stem, a root. And that's what a screenplay is. It's the, the thing you hang everything on it. But you gotta have one that's sturdy enough that can cover a lot of ground and so that you could have a lot of flowers on it. That's why uh, you have to start with a screenplay. Paper is cheaper than making the movie or the film. It's, it is, you know? So make the changes in the revisions of the script. You could do anything as long as it's still a, a page uh, with a pencil. And you can make things happen then, and, or if you do it, it's a lot more fun to shoot. That's, that's, I grant you that. But you gotta know what you're shooting, and you gotta know where you, the shooting is gonna lead to. And that's why you should never start until a script is as good as it can be, you know? But that doesn't mean you can't change it anymore, because usually you do change it even after it's been revised many, many times. And like New York, New York, we were talking about it over there. We, it has four different endings, uh, partially by fault. They started shooting before the script was ready and it was a, a chaos and really difficult to write a screenplay at night and then have it shot the day, uh, after. It was not a good experience. And the film, although it's good, it could have been much better. Oh, I love that film. We're seeing it in my class next week. I love that film. Oh, you love it. I, Which I really version do. do you like? <laughs> you know, I like the original ending, and I, I'm not even sure I've seen the alternate endings uh -huh. because I'm so devoted to the original. Well, uh, okay. I'll check it out now, though. Yeah, check it out. <laughs> um, Marduk has much wisdom and is in the midst of writing a screenwriting book, so... Oh, um, um, that's been on the work for years. Yeah, I have to write it before I go. You have great advice. So. Uh, can we open it up to questions from the audience? Is that okay? Yeah? All righty. Any questions? That's why I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming tonight. Oh, this you're is welcome. a real treat. Um, can you elaborate some more on Charlie's obsession with fire in the movie? Mm. What is she saying? Charlie's obsession with fire. Charlie, when oh, he puts Charlie his hand into the well, fire. Look, here's this. Very simple story. Charlie is not obsessed with violence. He's obsessed with getting up in the world. In those days, or even still, a petty crook became a higher petty crook depending on how he related to the godfather or the people who were on top. Now, his problem was he was also a good human being. And he was finding himself uh, taking care of his crazy cousin, you know, who, who did exploded uh, post office boxes and uh, did everything that would not help his career, 
Charlie's career because it was not good to do stuff that didn't make sense. And so he had a choice between uh, taking care of his crazy cousin or making sure he got the steps to go higher in the business of criminality. Now, that's the basic story. I don't know obsession with guns comes from, but, you know, to be a good gangster, you gotta have guns. Well, she was asking about also the fire. Fire. The Charlie's. Oh, uh, at the end. And, well, and then when he puts oh, his hand into the fire. I don't know, if you, you can read symbolism into anything, I, I just, <laughs> <laughs> I like to write a story and have Marty, uh, the director, work with me on a telling a story. I have no signal. You know, there, there are silly classes, I'm, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say, at USC, where they talk nothing about analyzing other movies, you know? Why did Charlie Ch Chaplin have cane? Uh, what, did, what is the symbol of his cane? I have no idea. I don't think anyone, <laughs> who the hell cares, you know? <laughs> they spend the whole semester writing a book about that or an article. I think it's important not to talk about what the scene is about or what it's about is not the, sto the, the effort should be to tell a story, you know, and to tell it as beautifully for other people, not for yourself. Right, if you want to do it for yourself, that's fine. Keep a diary. That that would be fine, uh, but keep in mind you have an audience who would like to see what your stories are. This is it's been like that for tens of thousands of years, where the caveman comes home to his cave with his with a deer, and he says, "Oh my God, you will not believe what happened to his wife." You know, I was walking there, and this little deer came over, and blah, 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 blah. He, she he tells her the story of how he got the deer. That's been going on for a long time, and that's what you do, should be do, thinking about now. Tell a story for, that other people can relate to, and that's why conflict is so important. A, and conflict is what makes a story a problem that a person has that people can relate to. If they can't relate to the problem, then you don't have, you have a self-centered attitude toward your audience. They should not be, they will not be following you. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. okay. Anybody else over there? Other questions? Um, uh how much of your draft work from Raging Bull made it into the final script? Everything. You have to understand Raging Bull you're talking about. I, I was the original screenwriter for a book that we, we, we hardly used. Bob De Niro came to me with a book and said, what do you think of this? I read it and I told him, I think it's very superficial. It's more about a uh, Jake LaMotta boasting about his, what he did and all that. It doesn't ring true. It's more like a job to praise somebody. And I said, well, what do you think? Is there any hope? I said, yeah, there's a lot of great scenes that's there. It just needs to be made fresher. Or what I what I meant is is um, has to make more sense, more reasonable. People can follow. People understand. So what's the answer? Go talk to these people. Make it real. Get the real Jack Lamada, Vicky Lamada, his brother. All these characters. What they were really about. What their conflict was. What their problem was. All that you have to find out from scratch. So I went uh, with uh, what they call a microphone, a uh, Sony recorder, I mean tape recorder, and 
got these people to talk. I spent uh, a week uh, with J J Victor Amara at her place in uh, North Miami. And we, I stayed at her house and I didn't show my tape recorder for the first two days, but after three days where I comforted her, made her my friend, I realized that she's going to open up maybe, tell me some stories. And she did. So every day there was something new. Of course, I didn't use all the things she told me because, you know, A, it, it, there were things I couldn't tell. C, there were, B, there were things that didn't fit, and so forth. So uh, then the same thing with the brother, and then uh, all, as many characters, Jack, uh, what's his name? Robinson, Sugar Ray Robinson. All those people talked to tape recorder, so I had, well, oh God, a couple of hundred hours of material. Now, this is where hard working writing comes in. You go and you sit and you listen, and you, it's, what's important is what you don't put in. That's the hardest thing to learn. What you don't put in, put in is more important than what you put in. I, I didn't say that well, but I think you understand what it means. It means what you don't write is important. So you save time, you save people's patience, you don't use it, you use only the 30 or 35 scenes that each movie has. Most people think they got forever to tell a story. No, it's only 30 to 40 scenes for, for a feature length film. So you don't have that much luxury of putting everything in. Uh, you can't put everything in. Uh, life is full of things that are boring or uninteresting. You, you got up in the morning, you took a shower, you, you brush your teeth, and went to the bathroom. Did any of this fit in the story? I doubt it, you know? <laughs> so what, what, when things happen that are important with a conflict, that's what you concentrate on. Take out those scenes from the tape that make sense to telling that story. So throwing away the needless moves and uh, story points uh, is the hardest thing to do. Can I use this? Will this fit? That, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, D does that answer your question? I don't know, I got sidetracked. When, when, we, when we interviewed Marty, he yeah. called Mardik the scout. So he was the warrior that would go out and do all the hard interviews. So if you look at films like The Last Waltz, Mean yeah. Streets, Raging Bull, it was literally... And, and pictures that were, I was not the main screenwriter. That he got no credit for. What we I realized didn't want to. by talking to some of these other people is yeah. he was the, the tenacious one that before any writing took place, he would go out and wow. interview people, kind of like a documentarian and literally have hundreds of hours of interviews, then go through the rigor of listening to it, transcribing it, and then crafting a story Or asking that. the questions. And, and asking the questions. And by, another film, by the way, which we haven't mentioned, is uh, Italian American, which is Mardik, uh, interview, uh, Mardik interviewing Marty's parents and pretty much crafting the whole film for Marty to, again, for Marty to be on camera and ask his parents the questions this ended is, up being the this movie. works best in uh, Last Waltz. I don't know if you've seen Last Waltz. It's a documentary about the band, a group called the band. Uh, not in at the moment, but in those days they were the hot group uh, called the band. It's, they started with Bob Dylan and the band, and then they separated. From, in any case, my problem was to ask questions of all the band members and all the people who were involved in the group. And I put all these questions, and out of the hundred of questions that were asked and answered, I used three or four, and Marty chose the last one. And it was the final arbitrator, if you mean. Okay, is that, is that right? You think? Okay. <laughs>
So we're uh, learning delightfully that your approach to writing is very research intensive. I was wondering if there were any stories on Mean Streets related to the interviews you did to get into that, that very specific Italian-American world that allowed you to craft such uh, really specific, wonderful characters. Well, I didn't, I wasn't 100% sure because I was still young and green. I wasn't sure how to do it. However, I did know one thing. If you make the people relax, to, to open up their guts, so to speak, then you could really get them to talk about things that they would not normally talk. So the idea is, when you're interviewing them, it's don't call it an interview. Just talk about it as being a conversation with two friends and listen to what they're saying because most people are so involved in their questions they don't really listen to the answers. I made them look like they were the most important person in the room with me. So whatever they said, they could trust. So they opened up and I knew that from my my uh, research on research, <laughs> so it doesn't. It's not so hard to do if you are not so self-centered and so selfish that you don't listen or you don't feel. Not just listen, but care. They have to care about you. They they have to care about themselves. I've seen them cry. I've seen them laugh. I see them do tell things that you would not ever believe, but they always, uh, you have to learn to make them trust you. That's the basic thing, and by listening to them. Anyone else? Hi, I have a couple questions about your writing. Raise your hand so I know where you are. Oh, okay, go ahead. I was wondering, um, how did you get into writing, and when did you realize you were talented at it? Oh. And also, um, how would you describe how your writing style and technique evolved from when you started? I didn't get that last part, but I can tell you about how I got into it was just by accident. I didn't have rich parents here in the States to help me uh, be, have a camera and footage to go on and interview people and put them on camera and learn to be a director. So I had to put it on paper as a writer. And that's how I got, because most of the other students that I went to school with had parents with a few bucks set aside for their kids to use a camera and direct. I didn't have that. So I was working as a waiter while I was writing. So that's the one easy answer. I don't want to bore you, but I think people are getting tired and it's getting late. Shall we go? <laughs> to the reception. Uh, yeah, let's go to the reception. Let's reception. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Lots of luck. <laughs> I really mean it. Lots of luck.